Good morning to you, and we are so glad that we are finally able to worship in this auditorium in person, albeit only up to 50 people, and that our worship in song has to be pre-recorded according to the reg regulations right now. For those of you who are physically with us, we want to say we miss you. Welcome to the presence of the Lord, and uh, perhaps... You may want to take this opportunity just to turn around and uh, from where you are in the distance and greet one another. For those of you who are tuning in from your devices, watching this live stream or in delayed telecast, similarly, we want to say to you to welcome, welcome to the Lord's service. This happened to be our second Sunday in our family live series. And uh, today... We will have our family life pastor, Pastor Jason Lee, later on to administer the sermon to us this morning. And I thought uh, it's good also to remind all of us that there are two workshops on this Saturday in store for all of us over Zoom. And if you have yet to sign up for them, please look up in the bulletin and begin to sign up for them. Let's come before the Lord's presence and prepare ourselves. And I will just read to you a passage of scriptures from Lamentations 3, 22 to 26, as a preparation before we pray. Lamentations 3, 22. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For His compassion never fail. They are new every morning. Oh, great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Let's come before the Lord's presence in prayer. What a reminder, O oh God, this morning. The Lord, it is your great compassion that has greeted us, your great love that has surrounded us as we woke up this morning. And to be able to come into your presence, whether just before, you know, you in a very physical manner right now in this auditorium, or perhaps even to over the devices in our homes. Lord, we know that you are here with us, surrounding us with your presence and wanting to communicate with us. Lord, we want to ask that as we wait upon you, Lord, we allow you to speak directly into our lives. We are again crown you as the Lord and master of everything that we are doing or even thinking. And this morning, Lord, as we entrust our presence and this worship service to you, Lord, we want to ask that you so feel us, feel us with your presence, feel us with your goodness as we return to you, worship and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. For those who are far who are here especially, we encourage you to make a stand right now as we join in together in worship in songs. Welcome back to church. Really hoping that soon it'll be safe together again as we did before. But for now, let us give thanks that we're starting to move in that direction again. As we worship, let's give thanks for His protection over us, for walking us through some of the worst months we've experienced. Maybe for some of us, this difficult season isn't over yet. Um, it may be far from over, but we take shelter in the arms of a strong, protecting and giving God, one who leads us by still waters and gives us peace. Amen. Let's sing this song, Your Grace is Enough.
Philippians 2 verse 5, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here is love thus as the ocean Loving kindness as the flood When the prince of life are ransomed Shed for us this precious blood
grain of sand. Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Behold, our God seated on his throne. Father, we commend this morning to your hands. Lord, Father, we pray 
that your word will speak to us this morning. We thank you that we can come before you to worship you. And we ask, Father, that you do your amazing work in our lives, in our heart, and change us from within, that we may follow you and obey you as your disciples. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, church. Morning. Morning. So good to see you again. And for those, those who are at home, welcome once again to service this morning. So this, um, this month, we'll continue with our Family Life series. So last week, we have uh, gone through a journey, right? The theme is the journey. We look at what singleness is about. And this morning, we'll look at marriage. Marriage is a journey that is for life. Now, many years ago, I attended a seminar where a missionary was giving us some tips about how to prepare for cross-cultural mission. And during the sharing, he said this, I asked my church elders, what advice would you give me and my wife before we go to the mission field? So the elders looked at both of them, and the elders said this, remain married. Remain married. So we were all going like, uh, this is not the advice we were expecting, right? We thought you can talk about some mission strategy or something about spiritual discipline. What's so important about this advice? Remain married as you go to the mission field. As we reflect upon it, we realize it is true. Marriage is so critical. If our marriage falls apart, everything else will fall apart. Your ministry, your witness as a Christian to your friends, to your family, your emotional and your mental health, well, they will take a, a very bad beating. You'll be very, very affected. You'll be drained. And your physical health will also suffer. And if, if you have children, your children will also be affected very badly. So it's no wonder the church elders wisely reminded him and his wife, remain married. And this call to remain married is not just for missionaries. It's actually for all of us here who have pledged our lives to one another in the covenantal vow before God in our marriage. And that is why when Jesus was asked the question on marriage and in divorce, he said this in Matthew chapter 19, verse 4 to 6. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So it's very clear here that Jesus is telling us that marriage is a covenant. Marriage is a covenant. It is not a contract. Now the difference between a contract and a covenant is this. A contract is an agreement that you can break if one of the parties fails to keep his promise, which is stipulated in the terms and conditions. For example, if you said you would do this and you did not, then I can break the contract based on our agreement. I can opt out of the contract. But for a covenant, it is very different. A covenant is a perpetual promise, a pledge that is for life. There are no terms and no conditions in the marriage vow and the covenant. So you notice that when you make your marriage vow, you only say things like this, I promise to love you till death do us part. And there's absolutely nothing in the marriage vow where you say, if you do not do this, I can opt out. Or if you do that, I will divorce you. There's nothing like this in your marriage vow. So if you take a look at your marriage certificate, which you receive, you get married in Singapore. Take a good look at it. Are you able to find any terms, and any conditions, any fine print, very little one, in the certificate? You find that there's nothing there for any terms and conditions. There is no place to break the marriage covenant. For what God has joined together, let no one separate. Now, what is so special about the marriage covenant that we must not break it? I mean, if the other party is faithless, why can't I divorce him? Have you thought about this? Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31 to 32. What Paul said. He said this, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Again, he reiterated what Jesus has spoken, and Jesus also quoted from the book of Genesis. They will become one flesh. He's talking about marriage. Then he goes on to say this, this is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. 
In other words, he is saying that the marriage covenant is a picture of the covenant between Christ and his church, which is established by his precious blood that is shed for all of us. And in this covenant that God has established between Christ and us, his church, you know what? When we are unfaithful, even when we sin against God, against God and we do not hold to our part in the covenant, God still loves us. God still loves us. And God still holds to his part of the covenant. And we remember the words of Jesus when he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And this tells us that even, even if one party fails to keep his or her promises, the covenant is still intact. It is not broken. It is still intact. And that's how God wants us to see the marriage covenant. Because according to Ephesians chapter 5, God intended marriage to represent the covenant love between Christ and his bride, the church. So the marriage covenant, we can say the marriage covenant is the unconditional commitment to love and to serve. The marriage covenant is the unconditional commitment to love and to serve. And there are no terms and there are no conditions for any, anyone to opt out of it. So we can say that in the marriage covenant, we are saying these promises, that we will remain married until death do us part. But if we understand marriage as a contract, then it will become like this. We will remain married until you do something that I don't like. So that's the difference. And there lies the danger in our world today. Why is that so? If you look at the statistics that is very recent, divorce is a rising trend in Singapore. It is going up from 2018 to 2019, and analysts say that the trend is likely to continue in this way. And Christian couples, we are not exempted from this. Divorce are happening. Now, I'm not saying that every divorce happen because couples are taking marriages lightly. But have we looked at divorce as an easier way out than to love and serve each other unconditionally for life? Have we looked at that way? That marriage is an easier way out than to continue to love and to serve unconditionally for life. Because to love someone who has been unfaithful to us, who has not kept the covenant, this is going to be a very tall order. It's going to be very, very difficult. And only God can help us. So my brothers and sisters, as Christians, we must look at the marriage covenant seriously again. Because if we have not captured, we have not internalized the weight of this covenant, which the Bible has clearly commanded us, commanded us to keep, then it will become easier for us to opt out. We will choose divorce rather than to choose to love and serve each other unconditionally for life. So my dear brothers and sisters, for those of us here who are considering marriage, I hope that you understand and capture the weight of the marriage covenant. That it is a sacred, it is a serious matter. Because once you enter into this covenant, you are saying, I am committed to love and to serve my spouse for life. This is what you are saying. For life, I'm committed to love and serve, even, even if my spouse somehow failed to keep his or her vows. So the question for you, those who are preparing for marriage, the question for you and your partner is this, can you accept that? Can you accept that? Continue to love and serve unconditionally for life, even, even if the other party somehow in the marriage failed to keep his or her vows. So I want you to enter into marriage with this political lens. And for those of us here who are married, remember your vows, be committed to love and serve each other unconditionally. Because as you do that, you will glorify the Lord. And that's what we read in Ephesians 5, verse 31 to 32. The marriage is the picture of the loving covenant between Christ and his church. I think Pastor John Piper says very well when he said this. Marriage is an act of worship. Have you thought about that? When we think that singing songs is, is worship, but you know, worship is beyond, beyond songs. Marriage is an act of worship. Why? Because it's a display of the price and the preciousness of the covenant-keeping love between Christ 
and his church. That's why it's worship. And someone else once said this, to the degree that Christians who are married live out this pattern of God's love in Christ, they witness to one another, their children, the church, and the world of the gospel of God's redeeming love in Christ. So marriage is not just happily ever after between two persons. Marriage displays the redemptive love of Christ, how you love and forgive each other again and again and again. Marriage is living out the gospel to each other and to others as you fulfill your marriage vows. In this sense, marriage is missional. Marriage is mission. It's not just a rule that says, cannot divorce. Die, die, cannot, uh, cannot divorce, must stay together. Why? Don't know. Because pastors say, because the word of God says, just stay together. Lah. It's not a rule. There is a grand purpose and there's a grand mission behind the marriage covenant that just like Christ, you continue to love in spite of and despite of your spouse's shortcomings. That's what it is. That just like Christ, you continue to be faithful even when the other is faithless. That just like Christ, you continue to put your trust in God our Father that he'll work all things together for good in his time. So my dear brothers and sisters, marriage is a covenant. It is missional. And our prayers is that every couple will truly understand this and we will all take steps to live, out, live this out and glorify the Lord. Now, of course, the question is, how then can we work this out in this journey that is for life? I believe you remember what Pastor Rick said last week, that marriage is Hard work. That's how I describe it, right? Hard work. And I agree with this. In fact, I tell couples this. And marriage is the world's uh, greatest discipleship program. It is. Because you get to practice 365 days on how to die to yourself. Okay, no need to buy a book. You want to learn how to die to yourself? Get married. <laughs> and learn how to love like Jesus. That's what it is. I think, you know, this picture is quite funny to me. You see, marriage lets you annoy one special person for the rest of your life. Okay, not two, not three, thank God. Just one special person for the rest of your life. <laughs> now, humor aside, how can we, with the help of God and the help of others in the church, to thrive in our marriage? I'd like to share with you from Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 to 14. And let's read this together. Right? One, two, three. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly love, clothe yourself with compassion kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Now this passage was written by Paul to the church in Colossae. It's exhorting all the Christians to show ourselves as true believers in our attitudes and in our actions. And today we will look at this passage from the context of marriage, on how marriage seeks to love. How marriage seeks to love. Look at verse 12, it says here, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly love. It tells us that as God's chosen people, we are all dearly loved by God. We know that how he sent his son to die for us for our sins, to save us. And Jesus did not only die for us, but now His Spirit also lives in us. The Holy Spirit is living in you. Because He said this, you have been made holy, which means set apart. To do what? Set apart to live like Him and to live for Him through His Spirit. And this tells us that, you know, if we want to clothe ourselves with all the virtues, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, we can only do that if God is doing His work in our lives. Because if we depend on our own strength, we will fail. So therefore, as God's chosen people, all of us, holy and dearly loved by God, we must clothe ourselves with all these virtues and above all, put on love. Put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. So we look at this picture. God is love. And God's kind of love can only flow down and come from God to us, being poured into our lives, that we might pour out His love to our spouse, to our children, to others. As mentioned, these verses need not only apply to couples, but it applies to all Christians. In this, the other picture, 
So we see that God's love is also being poured out to God's community, which is His church, all of us. So as we put on these virtues together, we begin to love each other. Whether you're single, whether you're married, we begin to love each other. So as married couples, we need to see that we need God in a vertical relationship. At the same time, we also need our brothers and sisters in Christ to support so us in this journey that is for life. So my dear brothers and sisters, as God's people, whether you're married, whether you're single, we all play a very important role in helping married couples to glorify God in this journey for life. All of us have a part to play, and we'll talk about this later. But now, let us look at the virtues that's listed for us in Colossians chapter 3. How can we love our spouse? Like how God has loved us. How can we do that? Let's go down the list. Firstly, compassion. The word compassion here has the meaning of God's compassion, God's kind of mercy that's being shown to us. So look, if we look at it from the context of marriage, I believe that this compassion, how God wants us to treat our spouse, is God wants us to see our spouse from this lens, to have this compassion, to empathize with their weaknesses, to empathize with our spouse's failures and flaws. You know, sometimes it can be, this can be very challenging because we, I don't know how you experience it, but we often, often uh, want to change or fix, uh, fix our spouse. Why can't you do this? Why can't you change? Why are you always like this? God said before, no? Yeah, I don't know, huh? Yeah, it's between you and God. And God wants us to slow down and say, look at this from his anger, to have that compassion for our spouse. Look back to God. Does God do that? Does God say things like, why can't you do this? Why are you always sin, huh? Why like this? Why cannot change? Does God do that? I don't think so. This is what the devil does. He will accuse you to the face and condemn you. But God is not like this. Remember the story of Jesus and the woman caught in adultery? When Jesus asked the woman, did anyone condemn you? And she replied, no one, sir. And Jesus says, neither do I, but go and sin no more. So we must ask the Lord to help us to be compassionate like Him, that we do not condemn our spouse, but we will support, we will care, we will pray for them. And the Lord Himself, He will help them to go and sin no more. We are not God. He cannot change or fix them, but God can do His wonders in our spouse. So put on that compassion. And this applies also to be compassionate to your children, to your family members, to your friends. Clothe yourself with compassion. Number two, kindness. Kindness is the opposite of being harsh and inconsiderate. To put on kindness means to be more gentle, more considerate in what you say and what you do. You know, sometimes when we are stressed or you know, out of certain habits or certain beliefs, we can become harsh to each other. So I think it's important to ask ourselves this question. Have I been harsh? Have I been inconsiderate to my spouse? And why? Why is that so? Ask the Lord to help you. Ask the Lord to search you, and He will show you from His perspective. And the other thing I've observed in couples is this. When there is resentment in a couple's relationship, they will find it hard to be kind to each other. They will say words to spite the other. They will do things like, nah, this is your problem. I don't care. So again, we need to look to God. If there's any resentment, even a little bit that we have in our marriage, in our parenting, we need to commit that to the Lord. Look at verse 13, what it says. Bear with each other. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. The focus is about the Lord, as the Lord has forgave you. You know, look at our relationship with God. You know, despite how we treated Him, I don't know how many times you sin a day. I think we cannot count. Despite how we treated Him, God is still kind to us. God still loves us. God doesn't say things to spite us or say, nah, your problem, pass you to sin. No, God doesn't do that. He's kind to us. He forgives us. And God says, we ought to do the same to our spouse. So if any one of us here, if you are struggling to forgive, we need to pray, ask the Lord, Lord, please help me to forgive. If even praying that prayer is a struggle, I want to encourage you to talk to someone you can trust. Let the person listen to you, minister to you, and help you deal with the resentment. Because the last thing you want for your marriage is for the resentment to build up. 
because as it begins to build up with a little bit of it, one day it will explode and it's going to get very, very ugly. So I believe, my brothers and sisters, as we surrender ourselves and obey the Lord, we will become kinder to our spouse, we will be kinder to our family. The next virtue, gentleness and patience. Now these two are very much linked together. Gentleness here also means meekness, which means power under control. If you have very little patience, it is really very hard to have this power under control. You get angry very quickly, and you make remarks, and you do things that will be destructive to your marriage. Remember the series recently on James? James chapter 1, verse 19 to 20. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. <laughs> now, brothers and sisters, how many times have you gotten angry and lost your patience with your spouse, with your kids, with your family members? How many times can you tell me? No, don't tell me. Okay, I think you can count. Huh? Sometimes countless, I do not many times already. You got angry and lost your patience with each other. You know, you say things like, yeah, yeah, la, yeah, la, yeah. La. Or you do your classic, go to before or not. This is the classic, right? So how can we be the gentle and the patient spouse that God wants us to be? Let's suggest to you this. We must clothe ourselves with humility. We must clothe ourselves with humility. Why is that so? Because humility is the opposite of pride. Now, pride tells us this. Pride tells us that I am better, I am more right, I'm smarter, I'm more spiritual. In other words, you are saying to your spouse, you are worse, you are wrong, you are stupid, you are less spiritual. Now, with this attitude of pride, I can guarantee you, we will definitely be less patient, be less gentle. Because in our hearts, we are thinking, I am better than you. That is the issue. And this pride will come out in our words, and our actions. We will say things in a dismissive and condescending tone. We will also do the classic roll your eyes like this. And we'll blame each other. We'll criticize each other. So my brothers and sisters, let's be very, very careful because pride is very destructive for any relationships, especially more so in your marriages. So what can we do to close ourselves with humility? How can we close ourselves with humility? I think we must let the Word of God speak to us and change us from within. Let the Word of God speak to us. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The truth is, no one is better than the other. No one is better than the other. You may say, come on, surely there are differences in our character, you know, in our intellect, in other aspects of our lives. Say, yes, you are right. But when it comes to the bottom line, when it comes to the bottom line, the Bible tells us that no one is better than the other. For all have sinned. All have sinned. You are no better than your spouse. No matter how much better you think you are, no matter how much better you measure yourselves by in this world standard, the truth is we are all sinners saved by the grace of God. That is the truth. We are all sinners saved by the grace of God. And this truth, we must carry with us into our marriage. Because when we know and we believe and convicted that we are not better than our spouse, then we will do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. In NIV, it says to value others above yourselves, that you do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And when you value your spouse more than yourself, and when you don't see yourself as better than your spouse, then you'll be quick to apologize. You'll be quick to apologize. You won't be wrestling with the thought, oh, I'm more right, she's more wrong. You know, oh, how can she do this? How can he say that? And that's usually the tension and the anger in a conflict because we want to win the argument. But brothers and sisters, let us close ourselves with humility. Close ourselves with humility and bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And right now I want to say something to the men, to the husbands, to the husbands regarding humility. Why is that so? Because more often than not, I find that us as men, we are the ones with our pride, which refuses to say things like, I have a problem. 
our marriage is not doing that well, I think we need help. Pride only looks out for our own selfish interests, our need to feel good about our ego, our need to have our own face, and we don't want people to know. We don't want others to think that I'm a failure or that I failed as a husband, I failed as a father. So we refuse to talk to anyone. We refuse to seek help, all because of our own selfish interest for ourselves and not for the good of our spouse or for the marriage. So my brothers, I want to urge you to put on humility like our Lord Jesus Christ. Allow others to speak into your life, to speak into your marriage and seek help from fellow brothers, couples, or even professionals when there is a need for help. Never ever let pride destroy your marriage or destroy your life. Let's humble ourselves before the Lord so that even in good times, when your marriage is doing quite well, be open to go for marriage enrichment classes. Be open for that. You know where often I hear this from the wives? Oh, pastor, you know I want to go for this. I think uh, this will benefit our marriage. It will enrich our marriage even more. Yeah, but you know, uh, my husband don't want to go. I've heard this many, many, many times in Bartley, in different churches. My husband don't want to go. They think we are doing very, very, very well. And even if that is, be open to go for marriage enrichment classes. It will enrich your marriage. So brothers, husbands, head of the household, I'm speaking to you and speaking to myself. Let us put on the humility of Christ. Let us say yes to God. Let us say yes to do all you can for your marriage, for your spouse. And remember, over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So we must look to God. We must look to God. Recently in our wedding anniversary, I printed this out. Yeah, I printed this out and we frame it. Um, this is the last part of uh, our vows during our wedding ceremony in our PowerPoint. And it says this here, we will dedicate and commit our marriage to be Christ-centered. So help us, God. Help us, God. We need God more than ever more, more than ever before, so that we can learn, we can have the power, we have, we have the grace, the strength to love each other just like how he has love us. We need God and His love to bind this all together. So firstly, we need God to love our spouse like Him. And secondly, how can we journey on for life in our marriage? We need the church. We need you guys, all of us, to support married couples in loving ways. You know, it's often said that it takes a village to raise a child. I'd like to suggest to you that it takes a village to support a marriage for life. Colossians 3.16 tells us, let the message of Christ Dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another. So to all my brothers and sisters, whether, um, you know, I want to tell you something. It's very important. Married couples need you. Okay? Married couples need all of you. They need you to teach them, to admonish them, to speak into their life, to encourage them. And to do this, we must build life together in our pace group, in our missionary selves, in our lunch, in our dinner, fellowship each other so that we can do that. We need the encouragement. We need you to speak into our lives as married couples. Because, you know, couples, are, they often look very good on the outside. It is true. We, we see other couples, say, hey, they are doing very well. They look very good. And that's what we found out. You know, recently, some time ago, um, you know, as young parents, we were young, very young kids. We were like, very tired right, taking care of our, our kid, not sleeping well. Then we look at all the other young couples with young kids in the life stage as us. Wow, all look so good. We were thinking, how they do it? Huh? So we were talking to one couple one day, and this mom was sharing with us. She looked really good. And she shared, and she shared, wow, she began to cry, began to break down. And we were shocked. I thought you were doing very well. I said, no, la, we are not. But we look good from the outside. And it's not because we purposely put on a mask. But it's how we perceive it. Like, hey, okay, we're well, doing very well. Until you begin to share and realize there are a lot of challenges. Whether it's as a, as a young married couple, whether with young children, there are a lot of different kinds of challenges, even those with teens or adult children. So my fellow brothers and sisters, please, encourage. Encourage those who are married because you don't know what they're going through. Encourage them. They need a lot of encouragement. You know, when brothers and sisters visit us and fellowship with us, uh, spend time with our boy Lucas, and we feel very blessed. We feel very encouraged. And more often than not, uh, it's those who are single who visit us more. Really. Because why? They have more time, they have more energy. 
and we are so blessed that they come and minister to us. To us, it's a ministry from the singers to the married. And we, are, we thank God for that. So my dear brothers and sisters, do look out for your married friends. Look out for them. Journey with them. They need all your encouragement and your prayers. Especially, especially for those who are married between five to nine years. Especially those who are married between five to nine years. Because why? The statistics tell us that this is the largest share of divorce in Singapore, 29%. Which means that couples who have young children, most likely very young children, they are getting divorced. And this is very scary. We are talking about young children at a young age who needs their parents the most, and in this time, they got divorced. So these are the critical years where couples who are married, especially in the five to nine years, they need your support. They need your listening ear. They need your fellowship. They need your encouragement that you spend time with them, build that relationship, and you discern if there is any need, encourage and persuade them to seek help. This is very, very critical. So my dear brothers in Bartley, please help those who are married to journey on for life and we can glorify the Lord together. We need each other. Now for those of us here who may have stumbled in this journey for life, you may be in separation, you may be in divorce, and you're wondering, how, how do I respond to today's message? I want to encourage you to continue to love and to hope in God. Recently, I attended a webinar on the topic, what if I'm thinking of divorce? And there were two testimonies of divorced couples. And one of them was Jay and David. Now, Jay found out that David had an affair in their home, and she felt very betrayed. It was very painful for her, and she decided to walk out of the marriage, and they filed for divorce. And at this time, Jay came back to the Lord, and the Lord spoke to her clearly one day. The Lord spoke to Jay and says, Serve David. Serve David. And she did that. Every week when she visited David and put their son with, with him, just, just, just to drop him, she would go and clean up his apartment. Now, you don't understand that Jay is a strong career woman. In her own words, she said, I'm a diva. I don't do house of one. I don't just do this kind of thing. I'm a strong career woman. But she obeyed the Lord. She clothed herself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, despite what the ex-husband has done to her. So every week she did that. And the ex-husband, he didn't even say a word of thank you. But she continued to do that. And through this, the son, her son, came to know the Lord because he saw the transformation in her life. Eventually, the ex-husband, David, he also came back to the Lord. They reconciled, they remarried each other, and they've been married for the last 24 years. So my brothers and sisters who are in divorce, who are in separation, I want to encourage you to continue to love in the Lord, to continue to clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, and to bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another, against your ex-spouse, against your current spouse. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. It's going to be very difficult for some of you, but forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. And over all these virtues, put on love, put on love, which will bind them all together in perfect unity. So I encourage you to continue to hope in the Lord. Continue to hope in God in your situation. And even if the option for reconciliation is no longer possible for you, you must know that you are still dearly loved by God. That's what God's word says. You are chosen by Him, that you are made holy in His sight. You are dearly loved by Him. And for our brothers and sisters in Bartley, let us also look out for and support our brothers and sisters who are in these more difficult situations. Let's reach out to them. So in closing, my dear brothers and sisters, remember that marriage, marriage is a journey that is for life. It is a covenant made with each other in the very presence of God that you promise to love and serve each other unconditionally, even, even if the other party fail to do their part. And when we live this out, we will showcase the beauty and the love of Christ. And people around us will know and will see who God is, that truly He is the God of love. 
And for us to live out this covenant and this mission, we must ask the Lord to help us love our spouse just like Him, just like how He is compassionate, how He is kind, how He is humble, how He is gentle, how He is patient to live like, love like Him. And let us be humble and open to seek and receive help from others. And finally, of course, we also need the support from God's people in this community to help the married couples to journey on for life. Let the end with this quote from Pastor John Piper. He said this, marriage, marriage is the hardest relationship to stay in. But at the same time, it is the one that promises glorious, unique, durable joys for those who have the character to keep their covenant. And that's what I mean by joy. You know, brothers and sisters, I'd want you to walk away today thinking, wow, marriage is so hard work, so serious, no fun at all, no joy at all, so suffering. No, 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 my brothers and sisters. Yes, marriage is hard work, but the joy, the joy that comes from the Lord in this journey called marriage, that is for life. That joy will be wonderful. The joy will be immense. It will be immeasurable. And I believe married couples here who are married for a long time can testify to that. So let us all press in in God's love. Let's all press in in God's love. At this moment, I'd like to invite all of us to stand. And we're going to sing a closing song. Let's sing this closing song as a response to the Lord. Worship team, over to you. Very often we find the people closest to us the hardest to love and we don't show as much grace to them. Sometimes things they do just make us feel like it's impossible to love them and only by the power of God does it become doable. The Word of God encourages us to bear with one another in love as we adore Him, set our eyes towards Him and with Him on our side, Loving another will be out of the overflow of love God pours over us. And it will be easier as we partner with the Spirit to love another. Standing in awe of your grace Setting my feet in your ways Entering into your presence To behold you face to face God of all heaven and earth Holding Hold you face 
God, we want to thank you for your word, for your song this morning. That Jesus, our Lord, we want to follow you wherever we are, wherever we go. And for those of us here who are married, Lord, speak to us. Lord, you know where we are at. You know what we need to look at. You know what we need to surrender. Lord, we give to you all that we are. Surrender to you, Lord. You help us in this journey for life. We pray for brothers and sisters also to come alongside us, to come alongside married couples, to journey together. So Lord, we commit ourselves afresh to you this morning. And therefore, my brothers and sisters, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgive you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And now may the love of God our Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you for joining us for service this morning. And for those of us who are here, if you would like to be prayed for, uh, please come forward after the announcements. And for those of us who are watching at home, uh, you can also send us your prayer request so that we can pray for you and more details of this in the announcement. So may the Lord bless you and send you out to be His sword and His light. Let's now sit back and watch the announcements. <laughs> 